Good morning, ladies. He hasn't always been mad as hell. Sean McAuliffe was happy as a lawyer, but eventually succumbed to writing and acting. Yeah, nice to be back, Stephen. A glimpse into the mind of one of our favourite and surprising comedians. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to One Plus One, I'm Jane Hutchin. For many years, Sean McAuliffe was perfectly content being a lawyer, but eventually took a gamble with something he enjoyed as a hobby, comedy writing and acting. In the interview you're about to see, Sean explains that he loves to break new ground. He's examined faith in a recent documentary and written a book called The President's Desk, his take on American history centering on a piece of furniture. But there's also his comedy, much-loved shows on commercial and ABC TV, including Full Frontal, Talking About Your Generation, and the satirical sketch show Mad as Hell. Sean McAuliffe, welcome to One Plus One. Jane, thank you very much. I hope you've got someone else on because I'm only <laughs> interesting for about five minutes. Well, funny you should say that. Because oh, right. We're finished already. <laughs> we, we're finished, that's okay. it. We're over. You wrote an awfully long time ago a piece about Jerry Lewis, who's one of your icons. He talked about how at the end of the day, it was all about the audience. The audience gives him all the information he needs and he no longer really cares what critics had to say. Have you found that good advice? Well, I think it's very true. Uh, and it's something that um, I, I guess uh, at the age I'm at now, uh, I've learned that uh, it, not to worry about what critics say because uh, for exactly that reason. And particularly with comedy, because I think they give you instant, they tell you whether what you're doing is funny or not. You know, you get an instant response from them. I think it'd be harder with drama to, you could fool yourself, I think, with drama into thinking you were doing something good and not know until later on uh, when you see it back and see it for what it, the horrible thing that it really is. But with comedy, you either get the laugh or you, or you don't. And if you don't get the laugh, they say you die. And I think that's a bit true. You, you cease to be as a comedian. If you're not getting laughs, then you are nothing else. Is it easy to sit down and talk to an icon? Yes, I think somebody who's part of your matrix in your childhood and, and you just grow up watching. I don't know quite why I was drawn to his films, maybe because he had that, then had that youthful exuberance. You could see him, you know, we were watching him on television, I suppose, and I was watching him on television in the 1960s, and these were films from the 50s and 60s, so he wasn't that old, older than he was being represented on television. And there was, I like that gangly, um, awkward quality, which maybe I shared as a, as a kid. I mean, I was a tall, skinny kid and uh, was clumsy, and I, I guess I related to him. Um, so meeting him many, many years later, and he was only about 70, I think, when I met him. That was just such a... And I knew so much about him, so I didn't have to do any research. And he was the nicest guy. You know, I, I'd read that he could be a bit prickly, and uh, there are other people who've found that. But um, I found him to be a very funny comedian, but also I, I liked the way he describes himself as a total filmmaker, so he produces, he directs, he writes uh, as well. And... Uh, to a certain extent, I think that's informed the way I've approached the, the stuff that I do. So when you were a kid, you were automatically drawn to comedy. I know you like the Marx Brothers as well, Monty Python, The Goons, Morecambe and Wise. Why do you think that was? I don't know. We had, I, I was brought up in a family that um, used jokes all the time. My grandfather told us jokes and my mother liked puns and I think laughter was a... Um, it was a coded way of being affectionate, I think. Uh, we weren't terribly demonstrative as a family. We wouldn't sort of hug each other a lot, but there, there was a lot, of, a lot of laughter. So I think I, I found that appealing. I found that warming, I guess. And uh, therefore, anyone who generated it in me, I had affection for. So in the early days, we didn't have a television, so it was listening to the radio. And it was a lot of those post-war radio shows, like The Goon Show, um, it's that man again, much binding in the marsh, and it's because it's it's audio slapstick. You're you're quite uh, closely working with the performers and the writers to conjure up those images yourself. Um, and the Americans supplied me with a lot of films that were on television, but it was the uh, it was the British radio comedy I think that 
informed that other side of what I still like. What about your dad? Was he funny? Uh, he was unintentionally funny. Dad's, Dad's Maltese. Uh, English is his second language. He's got, so he's got an accent still. Sounds like he's arriving next week. In fact, he's been here since he was 15. Um, so, yes, uh, there was a lot of... Well, his side of the family, less about jokes and more about humour, I suppose. Less about comedy and more about humour. So more real-life laughing and just the joy of being, I think. You know? So there were lots of hugs on, from his side of the family. His mother, my grandmother, didn't speak English, so that's how she communicated. She just you know, loved us all and she'd hug us all and everything. So, yeah, I, got, I had the best of both worlds, I think. And you started performing, you did acting as a child, didn't you? My mother says that I, at the age of about 10 or 11, had expressed interest in being in some pantom pantomime that was advertised on television. They wanted a lot of kids for the chorus. I can't remember that. She may well, it may well just be her own dream, living vicariously through me on stage. But anyway, I turned up at this audition as a 10-year-old, I think, um, with no idea what an audition was, nor had my mother told me or my father had told me. They just dropped me off and sat in the audience and I'm, I'm on stage and I was asked by the director, oh, what do you do? I, I don't know. Do you sing? I, I, have, I don't know. What do, you, what, do you know any songs? I think I sang Happy Birthday. I was still wearing my school uniform singing Happy Birthday. Appallingly, I can't sing. Can you dance? No, no, no. Well, what do you do? Well, I don't do anything really. I'm sort of just... I can, I'm sort of funny. Uh, so anyway, needless to say, I didn't get that job. But my mother thought, well, we better, you know, send him off to um, to acting school. So I did. I did acting classes and learned the rudiments of what it is to perform on stage, uh, breathing, projection. I learned to stage manage and do the lighting and and be in the sound box and pull the curtain. And started off doing that part of the chorus. Eventually found, it, found my way on stage. So I, I learned all those other things in order to be a performer. I can do lots of things adequately. I can do nothing really well. And really, I still have no skills. I can't sing and I can't dance. I have no business being an entertainer, honestly. It's comedy by default. You can't really say that. No, I, 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 I would love to be able to play a musical instrument or sing or, or have some palpable showbiz thing I could do. But I don't have the... I don't, I, don't have the felicity for it and I don't have the, unless I can just do it straight away pretty well without even thinking, I'm, I'm strangely not interested in it. So how do you describe what you've managed to achieve if you have pretty mediocre skills? Uh, well, I, I just think I do a lot of things quickly <laughs> and, uh, I, I, and, and, I, and I, do a lot, I do a lot of things and for not very, very long because I'm sort of challenged and interested in doing things that really I haven't done before, I in fact have no real business doing. I remember when I hosted a, uh, a chat show on Channel 9 with no experience at all. I had never interviewed anybody. I had no business being on Channel 9, let alone hosting a chat show, as the results proved. But, but it was a great learning experience. I, just, I found it very interesting. I really enjoyed it. So I've just been really lucky, I think. So you recently did a doco on the quest to find meaning in life. I think you went to India and you hung out with some Hindus. The blurb in that said that you actually almost joined the priesthood when you were younger. Is yeah. that right? Well, it's prob that's probably overstating it slightly. I mean, I was, f I was 14, I was at an all boys Catholic Mara school and uh, there was, all there was some suggestion that uh, we could consider the priesthood as a career option. And I remember thinking, oh, that's not a bad idea. I mean, I was quite, I was quite interested in it. I think I'd won the Christian Leadership, Leadership Prize for that year. And uh, maybe I felt obliged to at least consider it as a career option. But I do remember speaking to the religious master, who was um, a Maris brother himself, and saying, oh, I was thinking of joining the priesthood. He said, yeah, how old are you? And I said, 14. He said, yeah, just wait a couple of years. Just wait a couple of years. So I, I wasn't at the seminary door um, next to Tony Abbott, knocking on, saying, "Well, can I come in now? You know, I'm ready to go in." So it was a, it was a, as serious as any job uh, consideration could be as a 14-year-old. But having said that, I did take it pretty seriously. I took Catholicism seriously. I I, I listened uh, seriously to the sermons in church. Uh, asked lots of questions that were more about the, um, oddly enough, more about what was happening in first century Palestine, just trying to get some context, because you don't tend to get a lot of context in the, in the church when you're being 
read stories from the Gospels. Um, so do you still call yourself a, a spiritual seeker these days? Um, the, look, the reason we did the doco and the reason that we're continuing to do them, and, and, they're, and they're about faith rather than religion, and I see there's a, a distinction between the two, yeah. So it's, for me, the fascination was, and I think this is the key to any documentary series, is that uh, whoever's presenting it actually have genuine enthusiasm for the subject matter, and that's hopefully what's been communicated, uh, is, the, um, is the epiphany or the, that lightning bolt moment where someone gets it. Someone just then believes and, and, and they have great certainty about how the world works and how life beyond the world works. Did you get that when you were a kid? No, I didn't. I've never had it. I think that's why I find it, I find it enviable in others. And I think Me that, too. Yeah, I think, that's why, I think that's why I wanted to do that, because I was asked whether or not I'd want to, you know, maybe front a documentary. And I, I said, well, that, this is, this is in, immersing myself in someone else's world and, and meeting these people who um, otherwise on television are sometimes unfairly represented as being nutters or zealots, you know, sometimes enthusiasm or zealousness is, comes across um, and it might be the nature of television that does this because of course you don't get a lot of the you don't can't get a fair representation of someone's story in a little sound bite um, so I just wanted to see whether we could possibly tell the stories of these people in a, through me you know through meeting them and hopefully we did that so what did you or what have you concluded about faith why some have it why some don't well, I haven't. Maybe that's and that's a good thing because, of course, we could do more episodes of that particular series. If I'd not knocked looking. it on the head in the first one, I think you know <laughs> that was not a sound business move. And I think there are, you know, maybe there's not only one answer. Maybe there's several answers, which may have areas of overlap and maybe not. And uh, um, I wanted to look outside of the, at least the Christian model and its many many variants, because I, I'm sort of more familiar with that, I guess because I'm in there somewhere and wanted to go a little more exotic and, and, and it would be lovely to spend some time in a Sufi seminary in you know, Macedonia or something. I think that would be, be fascinating. You spent some time as a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Recently on this program, Jane Turner of Kath and Kim fame also studied law and said that even though she didn't finish, she realised it wasn't for her. But clearly, it was for you for a time. Yeah, I, I loved it, and still would. If you know the world turned in a different direction, or I hit a bend in the river, I'd, I, if I could be accepted, I'd happily go back and do it. I found it very satisfying, and I enjoyed um, the discipline of the law, and also the problem-solving skills that you learn from law. Um, I like argument. I like logic, and all those things. I think help put together a TV show too and it's, it's a discipline that can apply itself to many other, um, it's a key to many doors I think. Um, so during law school I found it, um, you know, I found it just simply an extension of high school. Um, the performance side of it fed the interest I had in footlights and review and they all seemed to be connected with the law department. Really, I'm doing nothing different on television now than I was doing. It's just a bigger train set now. I was just doing the same thing back at university. Same jokes, essentially. So what was the point, even though you quite enjoyed doing the law and you were, I suppose, writing and doing other things as well as holding down the legal job, what was the point that made you decide to, to go for the writing and the performing and the comedy? Yeah, well, I was 30 years old and I, and I was watching now television programs featuring Australian performers who were my age or younger. And I think at that point, you know, there's, a, there's always there's a point, anyone interested in film when they watch it as Citizen Kane and we're reminded of the fact that Orson Welles was only 24 when he made it. You know, it's terribly crushing to a lot of us to think, oh my God, he's already, look what he did when he was 24. And uh, I always took great comfort from the fact that Groucho Marx was 40 when he made his first movie. Not much now, I can't take much comfort now, but uh, at growing up and being interested in comedy, I thought, well, I can leave it a bit longer, I can leave it a bit longer. But then I was watching Degeneration, now Working Dog, and they were you know, probably a year younger than me. And Jane Turner, who you mentioned, uh, watching them on Fast Forward and thinking, well, I've got to do something now, I've, I've got to do something now or I'm going to be too, too old to do it, and my wife said, well, do it, why don't you do it? Why don't you just give it up and 
give up the law and go and do it. And I never really considered it as a viable way to earn a living, oddly enough. I always thought it was a hobby and not to be taken seriously. No one had ever... I didn't know how to get there from here. I, I couldn't see how it could be done. I used to be, and still am a big fan of Barry Humphreys. And I was just astonished when I watched Bedazzled starring Peter Cook and Dudley Moore. And thought, There's Barry Humphreys. How did he get from here in Australia over there into a, an international film with these hilarious British comedians? It didn't seem like something I could do from Adelaide. Anyway, it was as simple as moving, apparently. So I'd, I moved to Melbourne and uh, got a job as a writer on, and through Gary McCaffrey, he was writing for Tonight Live with Steve Izard, and they were doing a new show called Full Frontal, so I started running for that. A few years later, you were on Channel 10 with Talking About Your Generation. Did doing that program about different generations of comedians, apart from obviously, as some critics have said, mainstream popularity, what did it bring to your character? Um, yeah, for some reason it was, uh, yes, it was, it, was, it was seen as that I'd changed my act in some way, but I hadn't really. It was, I think the audience didn't mind me in that position. And also it wasn't just about me. It was about Charlie Pickering and Amanda Keller and, and Josh Thomas as well. What do you mean by the audience didn't mind me in that? <laughs> well, it wasn't, it wasn't like a comedy show in that, that, you know, here's what I think is funny and here's me doing what I think is funny. And, you know, it wasn't devoted to me in the way that... Um, rather indulgently a lot of other things I had done up to that point were this was a I was in the service of the show I was a it was a job I was asked to do it it wasn't something that I generated it was something that I hopefully hopefully brought something to so I think it taught me to um, it taught me and it taught others that I could actually act as a steward for somebody else's vehicle and do it reasonably responsibly while still giving it some personality that hopefully you know contributed to its success um, but what I did re what I did learn is that the my usual tricks of talking, uh, speaking circuitously and, and and lots of word games that didn't really work particularly with the studio audience. I needed to I needed to speak in fragments. It was a really interesting lesson. Critics say that 2009 was your pivotal year. Do you kind of see your life in that way? Your career progression in that way too? No, I, I don't see it as a career. I just see it as a, it's, it's a, everything's leading to something else, but there's no, no plan or anything. I think a career implies that there's some goal at the end of it, and I haven't really got any goal. It really, it really is to do things I've never done before. And I'm getting to the stage now where, where I'm thinking, oh, maybe I could go back and do that thing that I have done better. Like, I would like to go back and do a sitcom better than I did a sitcom whenever that was 12 years ago or I would like to go back and do a variety show properly you know because I have done a few things that I'm that were less than stellar successes I enjoyed them I enjoyed them absolutely but um, you know it'd be nice to uh, give the genre the benefit of what I hopefully have learned but I can't do everything I mean I, I appreciate that I have limited skills and I enjoyed writing a, a series a drama series called Blackjack which had Colin Friels in it for example, and I could never do what Colin did in that series. I could never, or indeed anybody in that series. But I really enjoyed writing, and I thought, oh well, that's, that's I, if if the you know the, sh the shop was closed up tomorrow, and then no one wanted me to perform on television, I could probably earn a living as a as a television writer. So, do you think it's important to know your limitations? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You have to know, and indeed, I'm sure that's why I like producing and writing uh, as well as performing because my limitations as a performer can be concealed by my work as a writer and a producer and, and being in the edit, for example. Uh, and you don't know what your limitations are unless you go beyond them anyway. Um, but it, I think it's, it's healthy to think you're slightly better than you are, otherwise you'd never really risk anything. So really, the, the thing that motivates you is to keep doing interesting and challenging things. There's no sort of higher ambition to be no. the most recognised face in comedy or no, anything like no. that? No, that's all a recognition of, you know, this Jane is a byproduct of doing work you love. I think, I think the, day I, the day I'm standing in the wings somewhere and I'm not nervous about going on is probably that's when you finish, I think, you know, when it's not going to, when it's not giving you a charge anymore. And to, to a certain extent, I had a real hunger for, for doing comedy. It was never about... Um, um, 
it, it always strikes me as odd that people talk about fame as if it's something that they can achieve and experience from the inside. I, 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 think, they missed, I think they get mixed up with uh, how they feel about people who are famous and they think, oh, that charge is really good. It would be great to be on the receiving end of that, but it doesn't actually make any sense. And also you've got no control over recognition and the way people react to you. The only thing you've got control over is the work you do. So true. Yeah. So that completely explains why you write a book about and called The President's Desk and you've never been to that country. That, that must be the supreme challenge. That is this, that's hubris on my part, isn't it? <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's a, a reimagining of American history since 1850. And, and to a certain extent, I don't need to visit that place. No. Because that, and also that place does exist. America does exist in a reimagined form. In fact, they, America itself peddles its its own fantasy of what it is and what it represents. And we see that through the films that I love, you know, the wonderful American films that I love so much. There's so many different um, versions of it. And there's this weird thing in the last 20 years of this American films, particularly big blockbusters, are yearning for some self-obliteration. It's quite strange. Is that they're almost like America is almost painted, you know, it's constantly being bombed or attacked or threatened and in the 1950s it was flying saucers and in the 1960s it was, it was their own children and then it's always under attack, America. And uh, I find that fortress mentality really interesting, yet at the same time let's peddle this other message of assimilation and, and how welcoming we, we, we are. And, um, I think going over there would disappoint me. I couldn't possibly live up to the no, fantasy, I, I don't think. I don't think, think so, because even when you look at a country through its news, and then you go, for example, to the Middle East, and you go to a place like Gaza, and you go to one particular neighbourhood, it completely blows out the sort of whole picture of Palestinians being angry, mean people who are fighting with Israelis who can be angry, mean people too. I think that's what I love about travel. Yeah, seeing life through the news lens. In other words, getting your view of the rest of the world from television news. It tends to pick stories or pictures or images or sound bites that um, attract your attention. And, yeah, and, so it, go, and it's, it plays with extremes. It's designed to make you flinch. It's designed to make you blink. And that's why fear is a very easy product to sell uh, through television news. And, and a gentler way of experiencing life is, of course, to go out and live it. And one of, the, one of the fascinating things I found when I was in India was that we visited, we didn't visit the major cities at all, we just followed the Ganges up to Gangotri Glacier, but we, we were spending a bit of time in some country towns. And I buttoned onto the back of, there's a festival every half an hour in India. So I buttoned onto the back of this, um, this festival which was taking water from the Ganges to a local temple, which everybody does. Uh, and uh, this particular town was half and half um, Muslim and Hindu. And I expected, I guess, not having ever experienced India, I expected tension to exist in those streets as we, as we walked through. Uh, but there was, there was no tension at all. I mean, it's probably rather naive of me to have gone in with that preconception, but these are the images that are constantly thrust at us through the television. And of course, to, to come full circle, when talking about news and satire and satirical news programs, what I found fascinating about Mad as Hell is that you laugh, you recognise that it's um, the skit is over the top, but then you go away and you start to dissect it and think about it. And you know, simple thing, Bill Shorten and his zingers. I cannot stop listening to that cadence now that politicians have when they make these very sort of glib statements. It's beautiful because it's, it's like a wake-up call to your senses and to your intellect. Well, I think, I think, I think uh, Mr Shorten enjoys the zingers as well. <laughs> I think he might be trying to play in, into that a, a little bit now. Um, which is, it's quite weird to have it come full circle. Now it's time not to do it. But we, we you know, with, with Mad as Hell, we don't go in with an agenda. We're not, none of the writers, and I'm not a political animal, certainly, and I'm not even in what's often described as a news junkie. I mean, now that the show's finished, I won't, I won't, you know, watch the news as closely as I have done. Um, 
because we can pick it up and there are cycles. And it's fascinating at the moment, and I don't know why that is, whether it's because I'm looking closely at our politicians and maybe they've always been like this, or whether it's, it's a particularly rich period uh, where we have, um, particularly in the Senate, some very, very interesting characters. And the, and the only thing that frustrates us, I think, is that sometimes we think, well, surely, I was, I was someone that said to me, are oh, you making fun of the fact that this particular senator is uneducated and inarticulate? And I said, well, I'm not making fun of the fact that this particular, I don't know whether this senator is, in, is, is uneducated or not. This senator certainly appears to not be terribly articulate, but the joke is not about the fact that this person is or isn't educated. It's that I think at the very least our politicians should be able to communicate an idea or a vision and do so clearly. I do wonder when the English language seems to be a little beyond you know, the basic building blocks. I, it, I worry about that. It's probably the only thing I really worry about. Speaking about the English language, I've read that you have a massive book collection. I, I do, I do, but they're all biographies mainly. So, so what are you looking for in those books? Uh, well, it, um, look, it comes from my love of film, so a lot of the, a lot of the uh, books that I have are um, about directors or about actors, and, and I find that a nice way of getting into the history. If it's a, a well-written biography or even autobiography, uh, you do get a, a beautiful slice of uh, the life around them. I mean, I do read history as well, but I just find it easier to have a more picaresque journey through a particular period of history with a particular person. And I guess film just inter interests me. The, the art of acting interests me. The writers, I often read about writers rather than about their, read their writing, for example. Now, before we finish up, yes. that's your article about oh, thank Jerry you. Lewis. Yes. And um, who's on your fantail? Who's on my fantail? Look, it was probably Steve Weiser. Yeah, <laughs> Steve Weiser. Let's have a look. Oh, it's an Australian... Uh, an actor, Australian actor, let's see if you can guess this, Jane, famous for his appearance in uh, a number of blockbuster action film. Russell Crowe. No, it's not Russell Crowe, I'm afraid you've got one more chance at getting this right to win the, uh, the fan tale. Uh, he's, a, he's a singer and dancer as well. Nice guy from all I've heard about him. His uh, first name starts with the letter H, his second name starts with the letter J. We'll give you some think music now. I know. His name Hugh is, Jackman. His name is Hugh Jackman, that's right. So Hugh deserves to be on, the, on a fan tale. On that note, Sean McCullough, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you for speaking with OnePlus One. I can't speak now, Jane, I'm eating. Mm -hmm.